dwelt inside of him like he dwells inside of us. And the Son of God was in the earth. And then he left his, the Son of God left the, the vessel of, of Jesus of Nazareth voluntarily before the body died. That's very clear in the Greek that the Son of God, the spiritual man, left the body and then the body died, not, not because he was crucified or because of anything that Satan did. Satan, who has the authority to take life in this world, he left the body of his own accord. That's how he overcame death. Well, how does he overcome death? That's how he overcame death. He left of his own accord. And because he left of his own accord, he was able to incarnate again. That's the whole key. He has to leave of his own accord. If your physical body dies, and Christ Jesus does not have the strength to leave of his own accord, you leave a carcass. And that's the proof that you are not fully saved. There was no carcass. The whole spiritual man breathed out of his own accord and took another form, showed himself to five, at least 500 witnesses, but more than that. And then disappeared into the highest spiritual world. He went back into potential. And from potential today, He's sowing himself as seeds into the humanity of this world. And whatever his seed is, it's called Israel. And now there's a war between the seed of the life of the soul of Messiah in us, which we call Christ Jesus, and the evil powers that incarnate all of humanity because we're a fallen race and we call those powers collectively the carnal mind, and they're both inside of us. And if you do not kill the carnal mind inside of you, it will eventually kill Christ Jesus in you. And that is the word to you today and to everybody. If you do not engage in this warfare, the powers and principalities inside of you <clears throat> will kill, uh, ultimately kill Christ Jesus in you. And I will tell you again, I've been telling you, everybody, for years and years and years and years. A general prayer of, I curse Leviathan, or I curse my carnal mind, they're laughing at you. And I'm going to be very bold because I've been preaching this for years. They're laughing at you. The powers and principalities in you are laughing at you if that's what you're doing. If the way you're waging warfare against the powers and principalities in you is by a general statement of I curse you, or I'm against you, or I bind you, or whatever you say, they're laughing at you. Because the only time you have power over them is when you recognize their activities through the thoughts of your mind or the words of your mouth. So you can be cursing your carnal mind every day for a hundred years, and you need to get this. If that carnal mind can give a thought to you that directly, uh, uh, directly contradicts the word that is preached here and it goes unpunished, all of your prayers of binding and warring against your carnal mind are worthless. Absolutely, 100% worthless. Why? Because obviously you didn't bind it. It manifested in your mind and you just said, just go away and I'll leave you alone. Your warfare has to be against sin as it appears in your thought process and the words that come out of your mouth and your behavior. And any other binding or loosing or however else you're praying is a joke and they are laughing at you. So, it's happening on the microcosm as well as the macrocosm. The war, what is happening? The warfare between the paradox, that between the elements of the paradox, Christ Jesus in you and your carnal mind, which is 
basically Satan and Leviathan. And they're fighting over you. They're fighting over you. And me too, they're fighting over our vessel, the temple. They want to possess the temple. And they want to think through the temple and speak through the temple and do through the temple. Okay. And only one of them can possess the temple. Now as long as as you are not and, and, and if you all that you are doing is saying some general prayer about your carnal mind or pride, if that's all you're doing, and the proof of the pudding is that when it manifests through your mind you don't you don't punish it. Not only do you not punish it, you think that's God talking to you. See, so I was talking about implications before. That's the implication. You think, you think you're right and the preacher is wrong and that, and that God is sending you as a prophet to correct the preacher. That's a legitimate conclusion to draw from the behavior that we're talking about, that that's what you thought. And whether the thought was in your conscious mind or not doesn't matter because the carnal mind succeeded in sending you as a prophet to deliver its message to the preacher. And you obeyed. And the one that you obey is the one that you worship. <sighs> so, I just got cut off right in the middle of the thought, and another thought came out and overtook it. Yeah, so, so this paradox, it cannot, it cannot continue. One will be taken and one will be left. One environment, one world will be taken and one will be left. Either we're going into darkness, into a new dark age, when the kingdom of God is coming in this country and in the world. And I believe that this country is the foundation of the kingdom of God, that it will go forth from here. And the same thing's happening inside of the individual person. One will be taken and one will be left. So you cannot continue to be a, a stream that produces both bitter and sweet water. One will be taken and one will be left. And if you are not warring against the carnal mind, the one that will be taken will be Christ Jesus, and the one that will be left will be your carnal mind. And what you all need to do, and me too, we need to pronounce ourselves guilty. You need to stop justifying yourself and proclaiming your innocence and pronounce yourself guilty because God responds to that. And I gave you the example myself. When that word came to me, that was my reaction. She's attacking me again. What do I do? How do I do? I do not want to sin against anyone. If you attack me, I don't want to sin against you. But your attack upon me is not my problem. My problem is that I do not sin against you in response. A lot of people attack me. That's not my problem. My problem is not sinning against them in response. Okay. So I said, well, what do I do? I don't want to sin. How do I deal with this? And then I said, well, I better ask you, is it true? Now that's the position I take as the pastor. I'm most likely right. Most likely I'm right. You need to be taking the opposite position. Most likely I'm wrong. But you need to at least consider that you might be wrong. See? So if you want to take the victory, this is what I would do. You need to assume that you're wrong. If I was in the congregation, and brother, this, I'm not, brother, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. This is what I would do if I would have done if I was in your shoes. If I was in your shoes and you were up here preaching this, I would have fallen on my face before God, saying, I just had a thought in my mind that completely contradicted what the pastor said. Please, Lord, forgive me. I cursed that, I cursed that thought that had to come from my carnal mind. I commanded to die. But Lord, if by any chance it could possibly be you, please help me because I don't want to criticize my pastor. Help me. What would you do about it? Is there, 
Is there anything that you would have me to do about it? But you, you, the Lord will never speak to you if you don't consider the possibility that you're wrong. And that there was an evil thought that came into your mind. So what we're talking about here is a general attitude. We're talking about a general attitude. Brother, if you want to, if you want to be, if you want Christ Jesus to be the one that's left, and your carnal mind the one that's taken, because it's coming. It's come that brother, that's what the catching up is. One is going to be taken and one is going to be left. And some will be resurrected to righteousness and others will be resurrected to damnation. What does that mean? The ones that are resurrected to righteousness means that your carnal mind will die. And the ones that are resu resurrected to damnation means that Christ Jesus in you will die. And you'll become a carnal person with the mind of the beast all the time. That's what it means. You can't have both forever. It's just a temporary perversion. And the way, the way you find out which thought is which in your mind, your thoughts have to be sifted. All of your thoughts have to be sifted. When you automatically assume that you have a thought or a dream and that it's something good that God's doing for you, you're just, you know, you're just setting yourself up for Christ Jesus to be the, for the carnal mind to be the one that's taken. You must pronounce that carnal mind guilty. And the way you do it is by assuming that you're wrong. When you're in a conflict with something that's being taught, you need to assume that you're wrong. And come and confess it and ask for help. You should never keep it a secret. But how do you come? Do you come asking for help? Or do you come telling me that I'm wrong and that God told you the truth and not me? That you've got the true word and I don't. Well, then you should be sitting up here and not me. Okay. But you're not sitting up here, you're sitting down there. So when you get a thought that contradicts what I'm preaching, if it was me, I'd be on my face before God, saying, well, what is this thought in my mind? What is this thought in my mind that completely contradicts what's being preached? Save me! Save me from destruction in my own mind! But you don't think like that. You think that you're the one that's right. You are setting yourself up for disaster. The Lord's about to leave you for carrying on the banks of the Jordan. What does that mean? The one that's going to be left is going to be your carnal mind. That's what that means. So you're all out of time if this is who you are. I don't even know where this is going. Maybe this is for people on the internet, whoever you are. You're out of time. Having such a high opinion of yourself. I will tell you, when the Lord started me, he, I was in that position where I was a prophet to the pastor of the church, although he never accepted me as such. He acknowledged me as a prophet on the floor of the church. I was, on my, I was horrified that I was getting words different from his words. Not, not with regard to doctrine, but that God was telling me things. I was horrified, terrified. I was not lifted up in pride, thinking I was this great person that has a, a, a message to deliver to the pastor. It's a heavy burden, see. So you submit yourself for correction. You don't hide. You don't keep it a secret. You submit yourself to the pastor for correction. You go and you say, this is the thought that I had. I would like you to pray for me. So, 
The deadly enemy of the Son of God is pride. Because the carnal mind is all rooted and grounded in pride. And I'm going to say this one more time before I go back to the scripture. You rebuking pride in general is worthless. They're laughing at you. The only thing that counts is when you recognize the activities of pride and the behavior of pride in your own mind and your own mouth and your own vessel. And that's what I'm here for. Because frequently you cannot do that yourself. And frequently, it doesn't even have to be me. Frequently people in the world can see what you are, but nobody tells you. Nobody tells you. People in your own family. Could, I mean, I'm not, I don't know this from, um, this is just a, a general statement that I'm making. I don't know anything about anyone personally. But frequently, members of your own family know what your deficits are. But they don't tell you. Why don't they tell you? Because you probably would just get insulted and never listen. Our, our deficits are the manifestations of pride in our life are obvious to the world. I'm a flip you, they're obvious to the members of, of this ministry. That partake of these meetings when they go on trips with us. We see each other. We all see each other. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows who I am. If your mind is honest, you know who I am. Everybody sees everybody. We see all of our weaknesses when we have meetings together. Everybody's exposed. You need to know that, that you're exposed to everybody that has the mind of God in this ministry, that has seen you in a meeting, and that has heard you speak, or that has seen your behavior. That's why we have field trips. And there are people who attend these meetings by telephone conference or computer that cannot see you, but they hear you, and they hear me. And it's okay for you to have an opinion about me. It's okay for you to see my weaknesses, as long as you don't use them against me. I'm a mortal man just like you are. But I'm a mortal man working the program. I'm working the program. I'm on my face before God, with my carnal mind and the issue of sin coming, working through this vessel or coming out of this temple. And don't tell me that you are too, because, why? Because your carnal mind still speaks freely through you, Think, thinks freely through you, and speaks freely through you, telling you that you're the one who's right. You are in a lot of trouble. Not with me. You are in trouble. You are, are in danger of your carnal mind being the one that's taken, uh, be, being, I'm sorry, that Christ Jesus being taken and your carnal mind left. To occupy your vessel. You're in danger because of your pride. Lord's trying to save you. And I'll tell you something, there's nothing more devastating than a person who's convinced that they've got it made because they've had good experiences with God. And then some kind of a judgment falls. I don't care how good your personal relationship has been with God. He is not fooling around when it comes to his son. And he's going to be teaching you and teaching you and teaching you and teaching you. And then one day he's going to smack you. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest. Everyone that God has appointed to ministry out of Christ Jesus is a priest. Everyone else is a Levite. Everyone else in the church, anyway, is a Levite. And the Lord said to Aaron, that's the Lord Jesus, you and your sons 
and your relatives from the tribe of Levi will be held responsible for any offenses related to the sanctuary, which is Christ Jesus in you, the sanctuary where the Spirit of God comes to dwell. Jehovah comes to dwell in Christ Jesus. <sighs> then the Lord Jehovah said to the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Lord Jehovah said to Aaron, the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah said to the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your sons, that's us, and your relatives, that's the rest of the church and the Jews, from the tribe of Levi, will be held responsible for any offenses related to the sanctuary, which is Christ Jesus. But you and your sons alone will be held responsible, not, not your relatives, not the rest of the church, not the Jews. You, the Lord Jesus Christ, and your sons, those who are teaching out of, your, out of Christ Jesus. But you and your sons alone will be held responsible for violations connected with the priesthood. So we're all responsible for Christ Jesus, for damaging Christ Jesus. But then you need to understand that when you obey your carnal mind, you have damaged Christ Jesus. You have, you have murdered Christ Jesus when you choose to receive a thought from the carnal mind. <coughs> so we're all murderers because we all receive carnal thoughts here and there. But when it comes to specifically to ministry and the head that God has raised up, you are fully responsible. You, I am responsible. What I am doing today is fulfilling my responsibility to cover your sins. If I didn't do this, judgment would fall on you. Why? Because even though you said the words, true conviction never touched you. What is conviction? You, you didn't believe you did anything wrong. So you say the words by faith, you know, but at some point that, that word has to, has to be converted into a conviction, which means that you believe that you did something wrong. You have to believe that you did something wrong. That you didn't smite the thought when you first heard it. That you came to me with the information to tell me that I was wrong. Those are two different sins. Both of this, both this inner pride in two different strokes. So if I didn't do this today, you would be subject to judgment. That's what the Lord's telling you. This is to save you. I have taken responsibility for your failure in this instant. The Lord just told me, gave me the scripture of Eli, of the soul coming back from the battle with Amalek. And Eli saying, I believe it was Eli, saying, well, did you kill Amalek? And Saul said, no, we didn't kill Amalek, and uh, we saved all of this cattle alive. They're good for sacrifice. And Eli rebuked Saul. I believe he cut off Amalek's head, if I'm not mistaken. He killed Amalek, and he killed all of the cattle. So even though Saul eventually lost his office anyway, Eli completed the, the executing the judgment. Why? Because if he didn't do that, Saul's sin would have gone on all of Israel. If I'm not doing this today, my sin would touch everyone in this ministry. This is me, hacking the head off of your carnal mind that you didn't do for yourself. I'm doing it for you with this message. That's the deadly wound that grows back, you see. I'm cutting off the head of your carnal mind today. 
we'll see how fast it grows back. If you're, if you're not convicted in this message, if you're sitting there still thinking that you're right and I'm wrong, it's going to grow back instantly. So, but you and your sons alone will be held responsible for violations connected with the priesthood. So, let's take that again. You and your sons, the Lord Jesus and the people that minister unto Christ Jesus, and your relatives, everybody else that serves God through the Lord Jesus Christ, will be held responsible for the offenses related to Christ Jesus and the people. That means ministries out there that are condemning any one of us where Christ Jesus lives, saying that the message is wrong or whatever else they're saying about us. We are responsible to deal with them without sinning. Now, sometimes we would deal with them to their face, and sometimes we would deal with them in the spirit. What if it's your mother? What if it's your father? What if it's your husband? What if it's your wife? What if it's your beloved children? This is a lot of idolatry for children in the church today. Even the pastor, the apostle where we were on Saturday mentioned that. There's a lot of idolatry for your children in the church today. That means if anyone that you know, relative or otherwise, that is blaspheming Christ Jesus, we are responsible to forgive their sins, but to rebuke them. If you have, if you have access to them in a manner that you can talk to them about it, fine. If you can't, you have to do it in the spirit. You say, I break that curse. In Jesus' name, I forget that person's sins, but I pray, Father, that you enlighten them so that they don't sin again. We are to, we are to defend Christ Jesus. So that's, that's, this, that's the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the people that preach out of Christ Jesus, okay, and the rest of the Israel of God are all responsible to recognize when Christ Jesus is being attacked and to... Really, the idea is to keep the sanctuary intact. We need to understand that the tearing down of the, of the, of, of the activities of Christ Jesus is the spiritual tearing down of the sanctuary itself. It's the destruction of the sanctuary and the earth itself. So we're responsible for the lives of everybody that will die if, 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 if the enemies of God actually succeed in tearing down Christ Jesus completely. And that doesn't mean that you attack people or confront people. Most of the time you'll be doing it in the spirit. But you need to recognize sin in other people and rebuke it and not receive it. But with regard to, and that's, so that's with regard to the sanctuary. The church is in a lot of trouble. And the Jews are in a lot of trouble because they cannot recognize the sanctuary. They have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is not a house. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. Christ Jesus is the house that Jehovah dwells in. So the church and the Jews cannot recognize the house or the building. So there's, there's sin everywhere, you see. But when it comes to the priesthood, it's just the Lord Jesus Christ and his sons are responsible for the priesthood. That means if I didn't do all that that the Lord requires of me, which I'm doing, to try and correct that sin, to try to help the person that doesn't understand and that is still sinning because they're in ignorance, I would have to pay the price. I cannot let these things go. It's my responsibility to correct every in the hopes of saving you. No one is picking on you or trying to hurt you. It is just your pride that doesn't want to be corrected, or doesn't want to be wrong, or doesn't want to believe that you need correction. We all need correction. I'm corrected all the time. So also, uh, those of you that heard the message of my comments on, on the field ministry last Saturday, we also recognized uh, another priest. We recognized an apostle. We prayed that he should be, that God might consider granting him longevity. That was my responsibility to recognize that and to pray the appropriate prayer for him. It's uh, the responsibility of the priesthood to help 
the, to help the, the rest of the Levites, which is basically the church, and the Israel of God, to help you uh, understand your sins and confess them, because the, the, it's the it's the Levite that um, I'm sorry, the Levite uh, attends the uh, attends the tabernacle, but it's the priest that offers the sacrifice. So let's see what else this this chapter has to say for us. And as I mentioned to you recently, the Lord, the Lord is helping us to to spiritualize the rule, the, the laws of um, the laws of national Israel to understand how to how to implement the laws of national national Israel uh, today. And um, I uh, I just want to say a word about the, the Jews today. Well, you know, there are many different fa uh, many different factions of Jews, but basically, the the majority of the Jews that uh, are that have, I hate to use the word religious. I don't know what other word to use. That are observant in any way. You know, they turn to the Talmud rather than the Torah. And I was really I really needed to hear this from an article that I that I read in, in a recent message where it was a Jewish man himself saying that the big difference, or one of the big differences between Christians and Jews is that when the Jews have a question of law or morality, they don't go to the Torah. They do not turn 